Wake Up Carolina on the iCorridor Talk Network. Hey, Dr. Uh, Rich O'Malley agreed to join us. I reached out to a friend. We have a mutual friend. Uh, and, and the reason I don't text Rich is I'm afraid somebody's going to FLI his phone one day, and he doesn't want my name showing up on any of his uh, – <laughs> uh, you should nod his head like, smart of me. See? They, 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 we, we don't want the world to know we communicate in, in this weird kind of way. But um, And we've had some disagreements since he's been here in Florence, and we publicly discussed some of those disagreements. But but I saw a story, and we had someone call uh, toward the early part of last week that, that got me worked up a little bit. The, the, the amount of violence – in our in our public schools um is something that you find welcome first and uh and good to have you well it's good to be, to be good to be here but communist godless you know people and then you invite the uh, educator <laughs> with a doctor from new jersey that, that, this should be that, great that, welcome anyway, right we'll, we'll set that aside <laughs> yes, for just a Jane second subject. well i mean the, the one thing that you have impressed me with and, and i mean this sincerely is the reestablishing of accountability the burning desire to have people trust the leadership of this school district. Is that, is that fair to assume that has been your priority? A- a- absolutely. Accountability is our number one thing. And, you know, when, when I came to this district, um, we, we saw that in the referendum. I mean, that was people did not trust. And you see this, you see it in your callers. People do not trust their institutions anymore. And everything we've tried to do, even the topic we're going to discuss today, is about reestablishing the trust in the institutions uh, of what <laughs> your, your 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 listeners might say. What makes what make a great uh, America great again? Well, what's made our country great is our institutions of education and police. We need to stand on their side now, and I think that's what we're trying to do. And 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 hopefully, everything we do every day and being accountable is allowing that trust to build everything. Okay, when I see the story that we've had a significant increase in the, the number of fights, violence in our, in our school district, it, it alarms me. Should I be alarmed? Well, I don't think you should be alarmed, and here's why. This has been going on for a long time. You know, we, prior to COVID, we've made a conscience, conscious effort to stop the violence in our schools. That's always been something that we've been doing, and we did that quietly, uh, and you see it in our numbers. Uh, with the outbreak of COVID, you see it all across our country. You you can turn on the news. People are fighting in airplanes, fighting in, in, in you know, it's kind of weird. The guy from New Jersey wants to stop fights, but, um, you know, this is what's happening in our schools. But the only way we are going to make ourselves uh, accountable, only way that we're going to do it is we've got to talk about. It. There is no one out there saying, hey, the violence in our schools is is bad. We're going to do something about it. Everybody else is brushing it to the side. I have no problem stepping forward and saying, here's our issue. This is who we are. I'm a big fan of Bill Par- Parcells. You are who your record says you are. We've got a problem. We need to fix it. Guess what? We're going to have to take two steps back to take three steps forward. But we did that with our finances too. Remember, we we unloaded everything and said, here's who we really are. And, you know, we, you know, state came in, they put us on watch, but we're in a much better place. And we're doing that with our violence now. And, you know, my board gets a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, heckling at the, it's them and things like that, but they really have stand by and I give them a lot of credit. I think other than being married to me, being on a board with Rich O'Malley in charge is a very difficult thing to do. And, um, I, I think so to be worried, no because we're going to do something about it. Okay, I want to take a break. I want to come back and ask you kind of to walk us through what you think the plan needs to be in addressing this violence. So we had an interesting call early this morning, and I wanted you to talk about this issue as much as you're uh, willing to. Take a break. Back in a minute. Okay, I said yesterday, and I stand by this comment, when I was at Hannah Pamplico High School, there was a certain kid. I'll leave him unnamed because I think he's still beating around, and I'm, I don't want to mess with him. I'm too old. He's as old as I am, so he's probably in worse shape. <laughs> but, but if you got in two fights at school – one was with him. There's no way anybody had two fights and one not with him. In fact, I thought his name, I'll use Joe Smith. I thought his full name was Joe Smith, come to the office, please. I mean, he was just always <laughs> into something. And fighting was his um, preferred endeavor. That's what he liked to do. And he wasn't real good at it. I mean, he really was not very good at it, but he did it all the time. So fighting in school has always been ah, a part of the uh, I don't want to say that the business of school, because that's unfair, but, but you're always dealing with kids who won't behave. Dr. O'Malley, is that fair to say? It is fair. To say. Okay. Uh, is there, is there a reason to believe you're talking, I want you to elaborate on your plan, what you think needs to be done, um, how we can help you get to a better 
place there. But are there any um, social economics that play into this? Are there any cultural issues? Are there any um, racial issues? I mean, I, I read in the article that a large percentage, an overwhelming number of these um, violent events include African-American kids. Um, we, we live in a world where everybody's called a racist for anything they say or do or react to or respond to. Um, say as much or as little about that dynamic as you want to. Well, there's a lot there, so let me try to <laughs> break it down. But really what we are trying to do is um, reestablish Florence One Schools as an academic institution. That's what we are. And the only place and the only thing we can do is to restore order so our classrooms, our teachers, and everyone can get back to the business of educating students. Nobody wants to be. But yes, uh, schools, I've been a superintendent now 18 years, and, and, and fights happen. But that right there tells you fights happen uh, as a rarity rather than what you said when you break down the numbers, it's almost one or two a day, you know, 225 fights, it's 100 days. Um, and that's all of our middle schools and high schools. We, we've gotten to a point where it's a major disruption. Um, but my point is, and, and in the packet, what I gave um, to the board, I had both the sheriff and, and the chief of police in the city of Florence give them the statistics of that same age group, 13, 18, that's happening outside of our schools. And so my point is, there is crime and a lot of violence happening in our communities and it's creeping into our schools. And what I'm saying at this point in time, and I'll, and I'll pause and say both the sheriff and the chief and our law enforcement have been fantastic in working with us and standing with us and, and are very much um, working with us to try, to try to curtail this. So we're trying to keep that from coming into our schools. Um, when you get this many fights and this occurrence and frequency, and what's happening in our classrooms and our administrators and our, and our teachers are putting themselves in harm way. Um, I think we need to do something. The second part of this, I, as I said, in my presentation is there's this, this lawlessness and there's a, this sense of, I don't care about the consequences amongst our students that I haven't seen in a long time. You know, the fights happen, but kids and parents would come in and say, Hey, listen, I get it. I take the punishment, my kid was defending himself, or this was wrong, and we move on. And that is not the world today. And that we, we talked about you can't turn on the television without seeing a fight on an airplane. When, 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 when have we started fighting on airplanes? When did that become? And what I don't want and what I am fighting against is the normalization of bad adult behavior coming in our schools. It's not happening. My point is enough is enough. I love all of our kids. I think all of our kids are innately good kids. Uh, and I said, the statistics, we're talking about 99%. What we really always do is rush to say, what do we do about the 1%? And we want to protect all of our kids. We're students first. But my point is I've got to really put the 99% first now. And sometimes when you get to this point, you've got to take drastic behaviors. And, and this is what we're doing. So the cornerstone of what I recommended to the board was twofold to restore sort of some order and what I think is reestablishing trust in our institution. The first is we've got to have a zero tolerance. It might not be the best plan, but right now this is what we need. So if you fight, you're expelled. I don't know how else simple people ask me. So how do we work in the community? How do we do this? It's simple to me. Tell them don't fight in school. It's simple, but you want a first offender expelled first offender okay. expelled. Now I'll second that motion. So, but I do want to say, that principal still or administrators still have that thing. If a kid's defending himself, sure. I'm not asking you to get your ass kicked and still get expelled. There's got to be some reason to that. And there is some reason to that. But the kid who's fighting, the kid who's intentionally coming to school to fight. Now, the, the difference in the world today compared to maybe what my critics will say in the past is we have this evolution of virtual school. South Carolina as a state has six free virtual schools. So it's not just that we're throwing them into the street. We very much say you can enroll in those schools. So there's an option now that there hasn't been before. But they made the choice to fight. They, they chose made the choice. this path. And, and, and we're saying this is not acceptable behavior in our schools. Do you have the authority to do that? Does uh, the state or the school board have to do something legislatively or policy related that empowers you to put a zero, policy, zero tolerance policy in place. So there still is a due process that goes to a hearing officer. And then the board really has the ultimate 
uh, authority to expel a student. So that board's to, that's not taken away. But what we're doing is and putting in our code of conduct and what I'm doing is putting it before the board to say, this is what you agreed to, which empowers us as administrators to then follow that. So it really is. But the the, the end all is lo- the uh, authority lies with the Board of Ed. I think the second part of what we're trying to do, which I think is far more important, which um, you had a call earlier in the week. I was thinking it was Larry. You know, he kind of evaded. Sounds like he's married to a teacher. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I, I've never seen, and I, and I know I'm not from here, but I've never seen such disrespect. And it goes from my bus drivers to custodians to our teachers in the classroom. And it's just, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about you, but, and I don't expect people to, I'm, I'm not perfect. And my parents weren't perfect, but I know one thing. My father said, you go to school, you shut your mouth. And the teacher and the principal were always right. We've moved so far away from that moral stance that we need to get back. And so the second part of what we're trying to establish is, is, is not even just, just conversation with teacher is if you threaten a teacher verbally, 45 days to our alternate school automatically. If you touch a teacher, think about this. I've got principals who are being punched in the head, punched in fights without any sense of consequences. You touch a teacher, you touch a bus driver, you are expelled. We have to say enough is enough. If we really think, we wonder why teachers are leaving the profession or why we can't get bus drivers, this is the issue. We don't talk about that because it's not a right, the right thing to do. But this is what we need to do. This has to be a hard stance. We need to reestablish who's important in our school. And I'm going to say to Larry, you know, I apologize. I should have done more early on. There's been a lot I had to do, but we are now coming to help those teachers, help those bus drivers. You need to learn to behave in school. We all know how kids want to have rules and order. We saw that. You know, we just talked about masks. No matter what you, you felt, when we did that, kids came to school. They wore the mask. They understand the rules. They didn't like it. Their parents told them not to wear it. But at the end of the day, they respected that institution. That's what I need our community to do. This is harsh. I know it's harsh. But sometimes these times call for harsh things. And I think we're going to be the leader in trying to say this as you look across the country. Let's go to the 1%. You're talking about 99, 98%. That's always the old story. 99% do what they're supposed to. One don't mess it up for everyone else. Um, who are the 1%? I mean, let's be as careful as we want to be or as, as, as uncareful as you choose to be. But who are the 1% and is it social economics? Is it cultural? Is there, uh, is it a gang influence? I mean, what, what makes these one percenters um, the troublemakers they turn out to be? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll be careful, but I, I t- tend not to be. But, you know, the question was asked to me at the board meeting, who, who are these, these students? It, it, this is not a racial issue. These are kids. They're all kids. We look at them all the same way. They come to our school all with the same intention. How can I get a better education to have a better life? Um, but 225 fights, 193 of them are African-American. Um, I would say, as I, I talked about, what's really interesting is they happen in the sixth grade and in the ninth grade more often than any other statistic, which is our transition years. And I think that's something we as a school district need to take some responsibility is something's happening in those transition years that this is becoming a big thing. I, w- I would say that. So uh, if you break down that gender, I would say it's more females. Okay. Th- and I want to go there. Interesting, uh, that, that dynamic very interesting. We had someone call her early this morning, a, a good listener and a good caller to our show that said, when Dr. O'Malley gets there, pursue that angle. Because he's, he's an African-American, mm-hmm. and he says th- there's a cultural element about African-American females. And he said, I'll assure you that the majority of the incidents involve African-American females. Is that true? And do we have any reason to believe it's one thing or another that makes that the reality? Uh, I would say that is very accurate as far as the wow. numbers go. So, so, so African-American females are, are doing the majority of these fights are involved in the majority of these fights. Yes. And, and, and yes, you could say, um, and you can wrap it around culture. I mean, if you, if you look around what they see on a daily basis, uh, that's a tough thing, but I would say social media by far is, is the end of the world that's coming. I mean, it's social media and what people can say without accountability and what people can do to destroy lives and how it interacts and things. It's just, 
kids today just can't handle that. I mean, they're always have to be on. They always have to, what someone says. We, we saw that, you know, two weeks ago when we had this sort of proposed threat. People didn't believe the sheriff. People didn't believe Rich O'Malley, but they'll believe Auntie Becky, who lived in Hartsville, who has no kids in the school, has no idea. But people were scared because Auntie Becky wrote something. I mean, that's that's the world that these kids live in. And so what's being posted on is is real. And, and it's just a it's a cycle that is something that it's hard to control because we don't have control of it. And then you put them in some of the p- places of. Um, of poverty and things like that. And, and, and quite frankly, if you've ever seen the difference between a, 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 a female fight and a male fight, it is vicious. I mean, it is a vicious thing to, to encounter. And I think that's where we, um, we're, 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 we need to do something. How can leadership help you? I mean, if someone's listening to my voice, whether they're African-American, whether they're white, rich, poor, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. We want kids to have a fair shake. We all aspire for that to be the reality. Um, we have a lot of disagreements on uh, issues related to education, but I don't think anybody disagrees that kids should feel safe when they go to school. Teachers should be kept safe when they go to school. Bus drivers shouldn't have to be concerned about hitting in the back, back of the head. How can community leadership aid and assist you in protecting teachers, bus drivers, and kids alike? Well, I, 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 you know, that that's an interesting question because everybody will sort of say that now and I'll be like, where you been? Yeah. And so I've got to do what I've got to do. You can come along with me and then maybe change when things get better. But where have you been? Um, and part of it is we just here in the South, you just don't talk about some of these things. And, I, and I'm saying I'm putting myself out there to saying, you know, and pr- the private schools will use it all against me to say, hey, look how bad Florence one is. But we're going to be better for this. And that's that's the reason for this. Um, but I really feel that everybody needs to just just talk about what's real, what's happening in our communities. What I'm saying is it's happening in our community. Nobody wants to talk about it. I don't, I don't know about you. I took my family to Chicago this, this summer. And my kids said to me, there are more sirens in Florence than, than there are in the, in the murder capital of Chicago. And, but people don't see that. And people don't want to talk about, it. we need to talk about it. We need to have leaders who are going to say enough's enough. We, it's not a racial issue. It's not a male female issue. It's if you want to make Florence better, you better start talking about it. And quite frankly, you better do something about it because we do a lot of talking. We don't do a lot of action. Rich, when will the board be asked to support you on these um, couple of items or changes you want to make? And and can, you know, I mean, vote, board members are held accountable to the voter. I mean, the voter is empowered to lean on the board members or encourage the board members to do X, Y, or Z. Time wise, um, when are you going to make the request of this board and how soon can these changes happen? So the policy takes two readings. We did the first one in the November meeting. So whatever that second, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but the second Thursday in December is when the second reading will come in and that's when it'll um, hopefully move forward. And then law enforcement will it be involved. The zero tolerance policy will be enacted and enforced. Uh, Quite frankly, if you read the article, I said it's being enforced now. Okay. Um, what I'm asking is really for the board to put it in writing to say, you're really supporting me. Okay. And um, you think this is the best avenue at this point in time to move forward. But, you know, we're, we're you know, we're doing it now. I mean, that's, I, I don't have time to wait. I don't have time to do those things. And, and some people say you don't have authority, but the due process is already there. So it's not me throwing kids out without a due process part. That's always been there. So. Uh, we've got to do this. We're we're in strange times now, and we we've got to take it. Um, and we're we're willing to do something. And you encourage public and parental involvement. I got to believe that always makes your job um, not not harder, but easier and 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 more likely to reflect the values of the community. Yeah, I I think this issue from what I have, you know, there's always going to be division. But I think uh, everyone agrees that our school should be safe, no matter what race you are, gender you are, whether you're from the North, South, East, or West, everyone believes. Listen, I've been involved in schools for so long. If there's a school shooting, it could be in the middle of Idaho. Everybody, I, I could spend as much money as I want because people think that, that, but that's what we need to do now. We need to all come together and say, this is just as important rather than a tragic event. What I'm trying to do is avoid that tragic event and be proactive. Is this, is this proaction intended to discourage gangs 
from being a part of our school campuses? Are gangs a part, and is this to discourage or make less likely we have that influence? Yeah, I mean, yes, there is a gang problem. We don't want to talk about that. Uh, gangs are always looking to get into our schools. Schools have been shut down for two years. It's ruined a, a big portion of their business. Um, so we have always tried to push them out and we've been very successful about pushing them out to make sure that they don't have access to our kids and our schools. And, uh, what we've learned is they will move on and, and go to the next place. If you're going to take that hard stand. So, um, I think you need to stand with law enforcement. You need to stand with our, our, our schools and, and reestablish our, our great institutions that are the foundation of a good community. I want you to agree to come back in the next few weeks and let's talk taxes, bonds, additions, improvements, some of these other capital improvements that we're going to do, um, and some of the bonds, some of the taxes that have been increased and the bonds raised. I mean, I raised hell on the radio about that not long ago. That's where you and I would uh, probably be on different sheets of music. But I want you to agree to our listeners. I mean, you've always been willing to come back and explain why it is you did what you did. Uh, will you do that for me in the next couple of weeks? Absolutely. Okay. I have no problem. Uh, never hide from anything. And um, I'm always available. I can vouch available. for that. I can vouch for that. <laughs> Absolutely. I will text our friend so he can text you. So when they <laughs> FOI your phone, my number doesn't show up. And it doesn't look like we're conspiring here. Thank you, my man. Thank you. Appreciate what you do. Take a break. Back in a minute. Wake up, Carolina, on the iCorridor Talk Network.